it occurred to me that it might be interesting to do a comparative build creating ostensibly the same character in both 5e and pathfinder 2. i decided to try a halfling rogue because it's an archetype i enjoy and most of us know what it's supposed to look like it's bilbo baggins it looks like bilbo baggins this isn't exactly a scientific process but i tried to keep a few principles in mind one defaults use the core systems to build with no extra source books like tasha's cauldron or advanced players guide no variant classes two intent if there's an option that grants resistance to poison in one system, but no similar option in the other, then I'll try to do something to make up for it, like boost your con score or something like that, that could mimic the uh, poison resistance. Three, close enough is good enough. I'm not actually aiming for the same exact specs, because first of all, that wouldn't be possible. And, and besides the literal same specs, aside from attribute modifier numbers, wouldn't be treated the same way by their different systems anyway. I'm trying to get close enough to see how the same character concept is expressed in two different systems. First is ancestry, or race in 5th edition. Halflings are very broadly similar in both systems, lore notwithstanding, but they are both small creatures, mechanically small, with a speed of 25 feet. In 5e, several traits are written into the race. A few additional traits are earned by selecting a, a, a sub-race later on. So in 5e, ability boost is a plus 2 to dexterity. Luck. When you roll a 1 on a d20, you can re-roll it. Every time. No limit. Brave. Advantage on saving throws against being frightened. That's a little bit of Dragonlance Kinder coming out, I think. Nimble. You can move through the square of a larger creature. And then finally, there's the subrace that you choose, which I, I there are two provided. There's Lightfoot and Stout. I chose Stout. With this subrace, you're resistant to poison, and you get a plus two to your constitution score. I chose this subrace just because it seems more useful than the Lightfoot option. In Pathfinder 2, your ancestry determines your ability score boosts and flaws, and your vision. Everything else you take as a heritage and an ancestry feat. So in Pathfinder 2, you have vision, you get a plus 2 bonus when using the seek action to find hidden or undetected creatures, and a DC reduction for targeting something that's concealed or hidden. Your ability boosts are plus 2 to dexterity, wisdom, and then one other attribute of your choice. Your ability flaw is a negative two to strength. I chose the Hillock heritage. This heritage enables you to add your level to the HP you regain during an overnight rest, and you get a bonus when your wounds are tended to by a medicine check. This isn't exactly a boost to constitution, as with the stout subrace of 5e, but it does help you stay alive, which is similar enough in the end, so I felt like that kind of created some symmetry between these two builds. And then finally, luck. If you take the halfling luck ancestry feat, which you're permitted to do as you at first level, then you're able to reroll a failed check once a day. So that's a lot different, I think, in in mechanics than the 5e version. You can reroll a one as much as you want. Then again, how often do ones actually happen and that one? Whereas in Pathfinder 2, you, you have halfling luck, you're able to reroll a failed check, but you can only do it once a day. Is it six of one and half a dozen of the other, or are they actually different? I don't know, it'd be interesting to kind of play these two rigorously and, and really test it out. All right, next is background. In 5e, your background grants your skill proficiencies, a language, some equipment, and sometimes some role-playing benefits like free lodging in certain areas or specialized knowledge in something. In Pathfinder 2, your background grants you attribute boosts and some more skills. There were a few backgrounds that were similar. Both systems have a background called Street Urchin, for example. But to round out my build, I chose Sage uh, with the Researcher feature in 5e and Scholar in Pathfinder. They're pretty similar. 5e, skill proficiencies in arcana and history. When you don't know something because you're a researcher, you know where you can learn more about it. Pathfinder 2 grants plus 2 to either intelligence or wisdom. I took wisdom. And one of your choice, plus 2 
or, or being trained, plus two to your choice of either arcana, nature, occultism, or religion. You gain the assurance feat in that skill, and you're also trained in academia lore. So very similar, I think, backgrounds expressed slightly differently. The, the Pathfinder assurance feat is even in the worst circumstances, you can perform basic tasks. Choose a skill you're trained in. You can forego rolling a skill check for that skill to instead receive a result of 10 plus your proficiency bonus. You can always take a 12. You can just declare that you've rolled 12 on, on, on something, which isn't too bad. And of course, if you level your, your proficiency in that skill up, then, then you're going to 14, 16 to a possible 18 auto roll for a specific skill. Whereas in 5e, you get proficiency in arcana and history. And of course that will level up as you gain proficient, as you level up because your proficiency bonus goes up. So you'll be getting two, three, four, five, six. And then when you don't know something, you'll know where to find out more about it. So that's not quite the same as declaring an auto roll, but you can get the information. It's just a longer, it's, it, it might take a little bit longer. Next is class. In D&D and Pathfinder, both, a class determines essentially your character's job. A rogue indicates that you're skilled in stealth and thievery, but there's a lot of flexibility, uh, more than you might think. You, you could be a rogue that focuses on lockpicking and finding and disarming traps. You could be a rogue that's focused on acrobats and nimbleness on the battlefield. Or you could be a pickpocket and cat thief. For this experiment, I tried to stick close to the concept of that classic halfling burglar. First up is hit points. As a rogue, you start with 8 HP plus your con modifier in both systems. In 5e, you increase your HP by 5 plus your con, or you can roll a hit die for it, at every level. Regaining HP after damage requires you to either take a short rest and roll some number equal to or less than your level of hit dice, or take a long rest to restore all of your HP. In Pathfinder 2, you increase your HP. You already have some HP granted by your, your ancestry. So you increase your HP by 8 plus your con, and you do that every level. That obviously means the numbers for HP are going to be higher in Pathfinder 2 than 5e. However, regaining HP is harder in Pathfinder 2. You take an 8-hour rest to regain your con modifier with a minimum of one times your level in HP. So for example, at level three with a con modifier of two, you have about, let's say about 30 hit points, but you can only regain six HP after a full night's rest because two times three is six. At level 15 with the same con modifier plus two, you have 150 HP but you only regain 30 after 8 hours of rest. Skills. Skills work a little different in each system. In 5e, having a skill means you add the corresponding attribute modifier to your roll. Having, so if, if you're, you're, you're rolling perception, then you're essentially adding your wisdom modifier to your roll. Having proficiency in that skill, though, means that you add your proficiency bonus to the roll as well. So if you're proficient in perception, then you're, you're, you're adding your wisdom modifier plus your proficiency bonus, plus your whatever you rolled on the dice. In Pathfinder 2, your proficiency in a skill governs how much you add to your roll. If you're trained in a skill, you add 2. If you're an expert in a skill, you add 4. If you're a master of a skill, you add 6. And if you're legendary at a skill, you add 8. Unlike in 5e, your proficiency isn't locked to your level. You can be an expert in something, even at level 1. So in 5e, from a list of choices, I chose acrobatics, deception, perception, and stealth. They all seem broadly useful for the burglar archetype I was building towards. Pathfinder 2, the rogue class grants a plus 4, that's expert level, in perception, and a plus 2 trained in stealth. You can take training in a number of skills equal to your intelligence modifier. At this point, I haven't had a boost to intelligence yet, so zero new skills are acquired right now. In both systems, further skills are available depending on other choices you make. Saving throws. Your class also grants a bonus to saving throws. In 5e, this amounts to your proficiency bonus to two attributes when you make a saving throw. So if you are asked to make a dexterity saving throw, you 
add your proficiency bonus. If you're proficient in that saving throw, you add your proficiency bonus for dexterity. In Pathfinder 2, there are three saving throw types. Fortitude, based on your constitution. Reflex, based on dexterity. And Will, based on wisdom. So in 5e, rogues are proficient in dexterity and intelligence. In Pathfinder 2, you get a plus 2 to fortitude. That's your constitution-based saving throw. A plus 4 to reflex, which is your dex based saving throw, and a plus four to your will save, which is your wisdom based saving throw. Next, armor. In each system, your class grants you proficiency at level one, that's a plus two in 5e, and at least a plus two in Pathfinder, with armor. 5e, light armor. Pathfinder two, light armor and unarmored defense. Weapons. In 5e, you get proficiency with simple weapons, hand crossbows, long swords, rapiers, short swords, and thieves' tools. Pathfinder 2, you are trained in simple weapons, a rapier, a sap, a short bow, short sword, and unarmed attacks. Expertise. In 5e, your first level perk for being a rogue is expertise, which allows you to choose two skills, or just your skill with thieves' tools, and double the proficiency bonus. In Pathfinder 2, it's up to the player to choose a rogue's racket, along with a first-level feat. I couldn't find anything similar to expertise in 5e, so I just decided to take the rogue's racket called Thief, which allows you to use dex instead of strength for your melee attacks. Sneak attack. This is a very powerful rogue feature. They're, they're a little bit different in each system. In 5e, you deal extra sneak attack damage when you have advantage on a foe, or when you have an ally within five feet of your target. In Pathfinder 2, sneak attack requires your foe to be flat-footed, which is a condition that gets imposed, for instance, during a surprise attack. Catching them off guard, you're catching them flat-footed. Fortunately, the surprise attack trait means that when you roll deception or stealth for initiative, creatures that haven't acted are flat-footed to you, and you get that trait for free as a rogue. Leveling up. In Pathfinder 2, you get to choose a class feat at first level. I took the Nimble Dodge, which grants plus two to AC as a reaction against attacks that you can see. There are several feats to choose from, and it mimics the roguish archetypes you can choose at third level in 5e, except that these start at first level, and you get to choose your own path at every step. In 5e, class features start at level 3, so they don't really apply here. Attributes. In 5e, the official method that's mentioned first in the player handbook of generating attribute scores is to roll 4d6 six times, ignoring the die that rolls the lowest each time. Once you have six numbers, you assign them to attributes. In Pathfinder 2, all attributes start at 10. As you choose your ancestry, your background, and your class, you gain boosts and flaws to your attributes, and then at the end of the process, you boost four more of your choice. Here's what I ended up with in Pathfinder 2. Strength, 8, that's negative 1 modifier. Dex, 16, 3 modifier. Con, 12, that's a 1 modifier. Int, 10, 0 modifier. Wisdom, 14, with a 4 modifier. Charisma, at 10, with a zero modifier. 5e gives you a little bit more control in this area, so I just mimicked what I ended up with in Pathfinder 2. Strength, 8, negative 1. Dex 17, so that's a still plus 3 modifier. Con 14, that's a plus 2 modifier, so that's a little bit different than the Pathfinder version. Int 12, which gives me a 1 modifier. Wisdom 14, with a 2 modifier. Charisma 10, 0 modifier. So pretty similar, and probably if I'd, if I'd used some other method in 5e, I could have gotten exactly the same at Pathfinder 2. Pathfinder 2, your influence over your attributes is governed by, by flavor, whereas in 5e, it's governed by just player preference. Uh, unless you take a different method of, of generating attributes, like rolling in order with, with no control over what number you put uh, by each attribute. That's everything. That's the build. That's a halfling rogue burglar in 5e and in Pathfinder 2. I think you can tell that they're actually pretty similar, and through this experiment, it became pretty clear to me that whether you're playing 5e or Pathfinder 2, you've got a lot of freedom during even the default character creation process. 
You add supplemental source books to that and there's even more to play with. In a way, after trying this, I feel like maybe it was the wrong experiment. Can you build the most obvious builds in each system? Yes. Yes, you can. Can you build something really unique or quirky or cool or unexpected? That's probably a better experiment, and it's the one you should go try for yourself in both 5e and Pathfinder 2, because that's where it gets really, really fun. Thanks for watching.